Mars. Oh yeah. All right. Guys, so uh, we begin our course in international uh, business, and today is actually chapter one, introduction and overview. And this is an introduction and overview, actually, of globalization. Now, here is the most ironic part of globalization. We got here in the classroom a bunch of Western Europeans, right? Who are getting lectured at, you know, by a Eastern European in Southeast Asia, right? Isn't that ironic? But that's part of globalization. Part of globalization means, again, exchange of goods across the world, exchange of services across the world, exchange of labor across the world, and exchange of investments. In this particular case, we got an amazing exchange of a service, which is an educational service, okay, across the world where you get to mix Eastern Europeans and Western Europeans in Asia. All right, so let's get started with uh, chapter one, globalization, and see what it is. Well, they got here as a case study, they got here about Walmart, and Walmart is one of the many examples about globalization. Of course, you know them all. We're just talking that you love your Samsung Galaxy. Yes, I also love my Samsung Galaxy, right? So Samsung seems to be conquering the world now, and it's eating the lunch of Apple, right? And it's e eating the lunch of Nokia, right? Nokia is falling behind and so on. So Samsung is on the rise, okay? All right, so, uh, so back to globalization. Globalization number one, what, what's the problem? What's the question? So it's like if you can't really see the screen. Ah, we, we, we got a, uh, too much of a light. All right, well, let's, let's try. You can't see, let's see. Hopefully it's a little better now. Is it a little better now? All right, so uh, Walmart, the biggest retailer in the world. It's got 4,500 stores almost, almost everywhere in the world, okay? It has extraordinary purchasing power. If Walmart has a specific demand on its suppliers, suppliers usually comply Otherwise, they'd get in serious trouble if they don't comply. Walmart has the power to introduce standards. And if it introduces it to hundreds, more like thousands of its suppliers, it could potentially introduce global standards around the world. Another symbol of globalization is McDonald's. You get to see McDonald's practically all around the world. I mean, they flooded my home country, Bulgaria. They flooded, I'm sure, uh, here. I mean, you got all of these international chains. And this is all part of globalization. Globalization, now, back in the old days, we didn't have exchange students like 20, 25 years ago. Uh, exchange students were extremely rare. Now, you got exchange students all the time. But practically going from country to country to country to country again to get to get to experience the culture and everything else. So globalization is steadily on the rise. The correct way to say that globalization has been on the rise since the 80s and has stalled and now we may be reversing globalization since the global financial crisis of 2008. All right, let's get back to globalization. All right, so what is globalization? Well, it is a shift to a more integrated and interdependent world. It makes the world more interdependent. It makes one business dependent on another. It makes the economy of one country dependent on another. Uh, for example, it makes Apple, the maker of iPhone, very, very, very dependent on the chips produced by Samsung. Okay? So, you got 
a lot of interdependence. And you have a number of elements or components. One of them is globalization of markets. Markets become global. You guys get to sell these BMWs everywhere in the world and we love them, right? Samsung gets to sell these galaxies all over the world and again, we love them, right? So, you have a tremendous globalization of markets. Many, many uh, goods and services are now practically available everywhere in the world. Very, very few markets are still closed like North Korea. And even now, the last one of the countries that is opening up is Cuba, okay? All the others are practically open. You can find almost anything in any country around uh, the world. And that's the trend number one. And the fundamental trend number two is globalization of production. Globalization of production means that uh, the German automaker BMW is producing BMW X5 in Mexico to sell it for the American market. All right. You guys have a lot of X5 in Germany? No, not so many. One of the reasons this X5 is a hell of a lot more expensive for a number of reasons. First, you got to have a tariff to bring your own German, well, it's actually Mexican made BMW in Europe. You got to pay the tariff and you got to pay the shipping. It is an already expensive car. So, got to be pretty damn rich German or Russian or Bulgarian or whatever to, to buy. But it's not as expensive in the US. Uh, now, X3 will be a lot cheaper than X5, right? Or not right? Well, right in Europe, but not right in the US. In the US, X3 gets to be a little bit more expensive because you got the shipping costs from Germany and the tariff from Germany, while the X5 has no tariff, okay? It's already made in NAFTA. So, in you can get a whole lot cheaper, you can get a whole lot cheaper uh, X5 than you can get uh, in US, than you can get an X3, okay? So, these are, again, market distortions, but the idea is that of globalization. So, if it makes more sense to produce it in Mexico, you'd produce it in Mexico. If it makes more sense to be produced in Canada, it will be produced in Canada. For Japanese automakers, it makes more sense to produce their cars, like Hondas and Toyotas, right in the United States, okay? So, that's what they do. Sometimes it makes more sense to move production to Eastern Europe or to Southeast Asia. Now, the hottest production sites in the world are Vietnam. Vietnam. People are moving out of China and moving production into Vietnam, okay? They stopped uh, moving production into Taiwan a long time ago, right now. They're... So, production, globalization means that sometimes you will have a company produce in a foreign uh, country to make it cheaper, or it may produce the engine in one country, it may produce the brakes in another country, okay? It may produce a third part in a third country, okay? So you may have to spread production, what we call a on the optimal place. Let's see what's next. Globalization of markets. Well, globalization of markets means that before, historically, distinctly separate and distinctly different markets are now getting merged or uh, getting to flow to each other and they're becoming very similar. Example which I would, uh, was explaining is uh, before Eastern Europe was so, so totally different from Western Europe. But now you come to my home country, Bulgaria, and you're going to see all the major American mega corporations. We love and we do drive mostly German cars, right? BMWs and Mercedes. Uh, of course, we use the older models and used models, which are a lot cheaper. But you're going to see uh, in Bulgaria more BMWs relative to Germany 
uh, that just happens to be the reality. Uh, the highest percentage of Mercedes in the world is in, surprise, Albania. Right? Over 90% of cars in Albania are Mercedes. Huh? Uh, well, it's a whole different story how they have them. But why, why don't they steal BMW? Why don't they steal Mercedes? Uh, sorry, why don't they steal Audi? Why don't they steal Renault or Peugeot? Right? Well, uh, again, the idea here is again globalization is that, yeah, we get these cars, we don't steal them, we pay for them, we buy them six, seven, eight years old, okay? Uh, we drive it again, it's part of globalization. Now, uh, again, everyone's having a Samsung Galaxy, part of globalization. Uh, all over the world, you, do, you get these, like that guy over there, uh, Apple MacBooks, yeah, that's a very, very, very good uh, machine. I have one, I love it, it's a great machine. So this is part of completely different marketplaces. So you're going to see a lot of uh, Eastern Europeans that will have, again, the Western brand names of the bags, whether it's the Gucci's or the Prada's, okay, for fashion. We're going to be using uh, cameras like Sony's and all that. So the world is totally having globalized in terms of Markets. Now, when it comes to Bulgaria, you won't see too much of a difference in terms of commodities, in terms of what is sold. Pretty much anything which is sold on the German market and it's legal there is sold on the Bulgarian market. It's perfectly legal in Bulgaria with a small difference in price, not too much of a uh, difference. Okay, the other major trend going on around the world is standardization of products. What globalization has done, in a sense, is standardization of consumer preferences and tastes. Now, consumers have not yet completely standardized. Example, here, everyone's riding a little scooter, okay? While in Africa, they ride motorcycle. It's the same engine size, the same thing. But here, it's the scooter type, okay? You keep your knees next to each other. And in the motorcycle, you have your knees spread out, okay? So, for some cultural or other reasons, Asians, and especially in Taiwan, and here, and I was in Macau, teaching in Macau, they all love the scooters. And they will not buy a motorcycle, they buy only a scooter. Say, so there's still some preferences, and you can't change those. Example will be Americans. Americans love big cars. They're, you know, they just cannot buy a small car. For them, it's, it, 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 it's like, you know, the size of their pride. So Americans love the big cars. Well, in Europe, we'd rather have a small car. Yeah, amazing. You can go anywhere in Saudi Arabia. I saw for the first time after two months living and teaching in Saudi Arabia, a BMW 3 Series. They have BMWs? Oh, yeah. But you can't find the 5 Series. They got only one series, seven, right? That's the only thing they know. That's the only thing they drive. Same thing. You can't find a C-class Mercedes. Impossible. You can't buy it. You can't see. It's not there. You can't buy an E-class either. But everywhere, they got only S-class, all right? And they drive S-class. Well, you're intelligent enough to guess what happens with Audis. No fours. No six, you got only eight, 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 right? And that's, that's the way it goes, okay? Same thing, you're not gonna see BMW X3, but you're gonna see X5, okay? These are important cultural differences. It's gotta be big size. Well, what about jeans? Well, the Middle East is an Arabic country, and when Levi's, you know, old Levi's, right, they do the jeans, when they sell the same American jeans in the Middle East, they don't sell. Why wouldn't they sell? Well, women in the Middle East aren't going to wear tight jeans. It's culturally unacceptable. They got to be loose fit, okay, for whatever reasons. 
So, the point I'm trying to make is, while we all get to love those Samsung Galaxies, right? And we'll all like to get one, and we do get one. Sometimes, and we have very similar preferences in one sense, sometimes you still have culturally different preferences, whether it's for historic or for other reasons. Could be for climate reasons, could be for cultural reasons. Sometimes people are totally different and they just wouldn't even look at a 3 series. It doesn't mean anything, okay? All right, but they get, they're gonna be buying only a 7 series. Now you come to Bulgaria, it's the opposite. You really, really, really see a 7 series, but 3 series everywhere on the market. So Bulgaria is the extreme opposite of Saudi Arabia when it comes to the luxury level of cars and the entry level cars. And again, doesn't mean they're smarter and that we're dumber. And it doesn't mean that we're smarter and that they're dumber. It just means that they're different people with different culture, with different preferences. So that's very important to understand. And while globalization is driving consumer preferences to be closer and similar, you still have significant cultural differences around the world. All right. Oh, man, that's there it is. Significant differences still exist between national markets. Uh, right on many levels of the dimension. So basically the differences are still there. And these differences require, here's the key, different marketing strategies. Sometimes they will require different packaging strategies, okay? Sometimes they will require a different advertising strategies, okay? And sometimes it will just require a completely different product. It will require a redesigned product, okay? When you redesign the product to fit the customer, it is still considered part of marketing. It's still considered a marketing strategy. In this case, it's called a differentiation or nationalization. In international business, the key word is, and you can see it a lot, of, it's called localization. Localization means to change, to adjust the product so as to fit local culture, local preferences, or maybe local requirements, all right? Now, here's an example where, uh, for example, uh, uh, Americans need to have a local uh, difference because of government regulations. Examples, Americans trying to bring in all of these huge vehicles in Europe turns out to be a complete disaster and a complete failure. Well, two reasons. One is economic reason. In Europe, gasoline and diesel is way more expensive than in Europe. So you can't just sell gas guzzling cars because Europeans are a lot more cautious, cautious about fuel efficiency. And here's the other one. Big engine, uh, big engine cars will have a significantly higher tax in Europe but not in the United States. And there is no tax in Saudi Arabia at all, okay? So, uh, Americans would think that they'll come with the American car and conquer the European world, and Europeans say, ah, it's a big car, too much gasoline, too much tax, they don't buy. So when Ford comes, what they have to do is they have to redesign Ford in Germany to fit European tastes for size, okay? And they're gonna throw in a European German made engine, okay? And then it would sell and it would sell well because it's half American, half German. Now, same thing about localization, let me get a few more examples, is uh, in America, everywhere you see Toyota Camry. Well, I can't see a Toyota Camry in Bulgaria, and probably it's very difficult to see Toyota Camry in Germany. And the reason is, the Japanese Toyota isn't even selling Camry in Europe. For Europe, they got a special model, a little smaller, a little narrower, a little redesigned, called Toyota Avensis. You guys see Avensis? Yes, Toyota Avensis is a fairly popular car. It is a modified 
Camry. All right. Now in the Middle East, you're not going to see Avensis. You're going to see only Camry. So the American cars will fit the Middle East market, but they cannot fit the European market. Again, European market is different. The preferences are different. They can still put the small efficient engine, but the Camry can't, doesn't sell in Europe. For whatever reasons, weird Europeans don't want to buy the Camry, but they buy the Avances, and so the Japanese sell the Avances. So, again, the Avances versus the Camry is a strategy of localization, changing the product to fit the market. Uh, in Bulgaria, we don't need to do that. We just drive what Germans drive, and we're happy with it, right? Okay, so different marketing, different operating strategies, and features to be customized to match the conditions of a country. Sometimes the conditions of a country could be, you know, the country is very hot, so you need a different air conditioning system. Sometimes people in different cultures cook different ways, so they need a different stove, okay? On the stove, they put a flat pan, oh, but they don't cook with a flat pan. They cook with a bowl pan. Okay? So, I mean, these are simple cultural things that uh, international businesses will have to learn. Let's see what we got next. Okay, so within globalization of market, you still have to understand that countries are different. Political systems are different. Legal systems are different. Regulatory systems are different. Culture is different. Oh yeah, some other thing you will quickly notice when you see big, tall people, they got to be Western Europeans in here. The locals are small in size. Try to sell clothes with big size, you don't have big people over here, you can't sell the clothes, okay? So these are all the same. Okay, so you have, with different countries, they have a range of different problems. And uh, so when you're dealing globally, you have a lot bigger complexity. Everything's more complicated. You got to deal with another legal system. You got to deal with another culture. You got to deal with so many different things. Okay, governments intervene. Governments intervene in trade for whatever reasons, usually to protect their own business, usually to create jobs, Usually they intervene just to make it difficult so that you can pay bribes, okay? We call this corruption. Governments love to create different obstacles, and in order for you to go through the obstacle, you pay a bribe, and then the government is happy, and business moves on. That happens all the time around the world, especially in the developing world. Uh, that's not going to happen in Japan, for example. Okay? And not going to happen in Germany, okay? But it will happen in a lot of, a lot of developing countries. Okay? And international investment is affected by different countries. Some countries are a lot more attractive for investment, and some countries are simply not attractive for investment. Some countries' government are very honest with extremely low level of corruption in some countries government are very dishonest and they try to rip you off in every possible way and then the locals try to rip you off and then you can't rely on the judicial system to help you so you're a little bit of helpless unless you're a multinational corporation and you maintain your own army and you maintain your own justice system, okay? And you maintain your own enforcement in everything else. But otherwise, it is very complicated for international businesses. We've got 10 more minutes. Let's see what we have. All right, so globalization of production essentially means globalizations of the factors of production. And the factors of production are labor and Capital. Back in the old days, from about 200, 300 years ago, with the birth of economics in 1776 <coughs> by Adam Smith, in economics we like always to separate land as a separate factor of production. And we've done it for 200 years, so we like to say 
labor, land and capital, but understanding that land is part of capital. Okay, land is part of capital. So, what does it mean? It means that now multinational corporations, businesses, including universities like this one, will be using foreign labor. Okay, they'll be using a lot of foreign labor. They'll be using a lot of foreign capital. Most of the things you see here, foreign capital. Uh, the projector is foreign and imported. The computer is foreign and imported. The uh, screen is foreign and imported. Well, the textbook that we're using is again foreign and exported, all right? And when you get to look at your watch, your watch is also foreign and exported, but that's a different sort. It's a consumer good. So businesses will use most of their inputs, like oil will be foreign and in this case imported, all right? So businesses will use all sorts of imported stuff as part of their input. And they will be spreading, they will be spreading production in different countries wherever production is cheaper. Wherever the resource may be of labor or the resource may be of land or the resource of capital would be the cheapest. In other words, you will move production to that place where the combination of labor, land, and capital will give you the lowest overall cost for the relatively highest overall quantity. Yeah, we have about three, five more minutes, and then we're going to take a nap, right? <laughs> right? Okay, so differences in the cost of factors, in other words, German labor is expensive and labor in India and Bangladesh is very cheap. So differences in the cost will determine where you're going to go or differences in quality. Okay, sometimes you may go where the cost is lower, we call it cheaper, or you may go where the quality is higher, depending on the type of product that you do. Let's see, all right, we got this here, global whatever, uh, design, swan optical, they have some, say they cover everything, manufacturing, I don't know what this is, let's move on. Oh, different colors, you see guys, the color here is green and on the screen is red. Yeah, yeah, they, they have some color. Okay, so, you make the design in one place, it looks to me like France, right? Oh yeah, and some other place, that's got to be little Italy, right? I mean, if you want to do design, you're going to do it in Italy, right? Italians are, we know, the best designers. I mean, all of these top brand names are pretty much Italian brand names, right? When it comes to cars, again, Italians will have the best designer, right? For, especially for those specialty cars, okay? We call these exotic cars. The, all the exotic cars are Ferrari, Lamborghini, right? All right, see what else we got here. Let's see. Oh, you also do some design here in Japan. That, that's interesting, yeah. And all oh, manufacturing will be somewhere in Southeast Asia. Could be Indonesia, could be whatever the place is. And again, so you're going to have design spread around the world. And you're going to have manufacturing in one other place and it's still you can have marketing and sales finance accounting in still yet another country that's going to be the country of usually the headquarters let's see what else we got in here okay manufacturing also done in china all right so which is one of the most important trends related to globalization and it's the steadily, uh, sorry, steadily and rapidly rising global trade. And here you got a world trade and production. And here is the key. Global trade is growing and rising faster than global production. So if production grows by 4%, trade goes by 10%. And you can see over here how you have 
trade lagging behind production and later on trade accelerating. So trade growing significantly faster than production. The other very important trade to understand is that of investments is rising even faster than trade. So you got a global production, global trade going a lot faster than production, and global investment going even faster than production. I mean, these are not the real numbers, but you can think of it this way. If economic growth is 5%, trade is growing at 10%, and investments are growing at 15%. All right, so you have a very rapid growth of global trade, and you can see the growth expanding steadily in the 70s and 80s, but skyrocketing in the 90s. The reason for the growth in the 90s is the collapse of Eastern Europe and the collapse of many other closed economies. So opening up of Eastern Europe, some countries in Latin America, and also the opening up of Asia accounts for this rapid increase of globalization after the 90s. All right, let's, let's see what we have so we finish over here. Okay, we finish up to global institutions. Next time, guys, please remind me and we continue with global institutions. Finish?